Net zero is the future, but how do we get there? In this video, I'll propose three steps actuaries can take to bridge the gap. Insurance enables people and businesses to go about their lives without the risk of catastrophic financial loss. And that's great if you're enabling good, but less so if you're enabling major polluters. But despite over 29 insurers being part of the Net Zero Insurance Alliance, only three have made the commitment to cease writing oil and gas. And there are two big reasons for this snail's pace. Firstly, that sudden underwriting exclusions won't help customers make change, and it can even be destabilising for them and the economy. Secondly, and rather more cynically, the oil and gas insurance market was valued at $18.5 billion in 2020. That's a lot of top line to lose, but we know that climate change makes natural catastrophes more severe and therefore more expensive. Insurance is a social good, but it needs to generally be profitable to be sustainable. We shouldn't continue to enable the worst polluters while paying through the nose to indemnify others from their effects. So we need to start bridging this gap now. The first thing actuaries can do is to extend their toolkit from risk quantification to risk allocation for catastrophe claims. One way this can be done without hitting the top line is to reduce claim payments in a risk-based way by reducing the amount of cover provided to polluters by an independent and objective measure based on how much they've contributed to the risk of this event occurring. For this, we can use the IPCC's method of risk allocation. For example, for the UK flooding in autumn 2000, they were 90% sure that anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions increased the risk of this event by more than 20%, and 66% sure of an increase of more than 90%. With industry consensus, risk actuaries could use a given risk tolerance and reduce claims paid to large polluters by this amount. These risk attribution estimates now only take days to complete, so would likely be available for all major weather events around the time that early claims estimates are made. Or to take another example, in 2005, Hurricanes Katrina and Rita destroyed 109 oil platforms and five drilling rigs in the Gulf of Mexico, the most valuable of which was worth $330 million. Higher sea levels caused by carbon emissions led to the flood elevations being 15 to 60% higher than otherwise. Even if we take just the bottom of that range, on one rig alone, the claims payment could be reduced by $49.5 million. This would be a relatively easy thing to implement, but it would be a big step in getting polluters to bear the risk of their own actions. Step two on our bridge to net zero involves getting polluters to pay more for their insurance. Actuaries could implement this by using a pollution-based metric as an input to their pricing models. This could be carbon emissions of a company, but it could also be adapted for retail products too. For example, by using home efficiency rating or the amount of fuel usage. In fact, this methodology could be used for any pollutant, whether that's the amount of sewage dumped in water or even plastic production. The idea is to penalise the policyholders' polluting behaviour with the aim of encouraging a behaviour that reduces risk overall. And by using publicly available independent metrics, this extra premium is effectively a levy that could and should be applied equally by all insurers. Step three is that this creates a massive pot of money. So what should we do with it all? Well, there's a few options. We could use it to subsidise insurance for those most affected by climate change. For example, by using this to fund schemes like Flood Reef. Or we could subsidise insurance for those actively helping the transition, like renewable energy companies. We could use it to build back better, that is, to augment the claims payments to those affected by natural catastrophes, if they reduce their future exposure to risk. This could be by adding additional flood prevention methods, or even covering moving costs. Or we could use it to help the sustainability of insurers after a natural catastrophe. This would act like an industry catastrophe buffer. When that cuts over a certain size, money is taken out of the fund and used by insurers to pay customer claims. 
This would help protect insurers from the most severe events and ensure a stable and sustainable supply of cat insurance. So step three is really the fun stage because it's full of exciting possibilities and opportunities for actuaries, not only to create a fairer and more equitable society, but it also provides an amazing platform for actuaries to promote their skills and expertise in dealing with complex, converging global risks. So that's my three-step plan, but will it work? Actually, history has shown that it will, because steps one and two reduce benefits and increase contributions, have been the two levers to making defined benefit schemes sustainable. In that context, the aim was to transfer risk from companies to individuals, and it worked. I propose that we use the same two levers over the next decade, but with the aim of transferring risk from those affected to those who are most driving climate change. These steps are naturally and steadily going to decrease demand for oil and gas insurance while actively encouraging those who produce or use the most pollutants to change their behaviour. And that's how actuaries can create a bridge to a net zero future.